morning. I'm Ellen Horseman. Welcome to Camden, Arkansas's First United Methodist Church Sunday School. We're doing a study right now in, uh, with a book by Adam Hamilton called John, The Gospel of Light and Life. It's only six chapters long, so it's just kind of an introduction to what the Gospel of John is like and to some of its major themes and ideas. This week we're looking at a chapter called The Miraculous Signs of Jesus. Signs is what John would call what you and I call miracles. Now remember that John's Gospel is a theological one which attempts to look closer at the deeper meaning of Jesus' Jesus's life and of who Jesus is. That means that John kind of invites you to read him at a deeper level. This is the way that William Barclay explained it. In John's Gospel, always, there are two things. There's the simple surface story that anyone can understand and retell, but there's also a wealth of deeper meaning for him who has the eagerness to search and the eye to see and the mind to understand. So John, John's Gospel, John's stories can be read on at least two levels or on multiple levels in the way that a lot of good literature can be. And I will say that when I studied literature with my students and we'd begin to take a work apart structurally and we'd begin to look at the different levels of meaning, invariably I'd have some students say, well, do you think the author really intended for all of that to be there? And of course, my question would always be, do you think this could be accidental? I think if, as you begin to explore John and perhaps with help from scholars begin to look at the levels of meaning in John, you can realize that, that the writer did this intentionally because he wanted us to think about who Jesus is, what Jesus means, and how and what that means for our lives. So, um, as Adam Hamilton put it, the more you read John, the more it appears that the stories and the details point to the kind of deeper meaning, something that scholars who've made John's their life's work are quick to point out. And as I said, John calls his miracles signs. And the very fact that he uses the word signs tells me that, that there's a message in this story. Because after all, think about what signs are for in life. They point to something. Here's the way Lutheran pastor Reverend Edward Marquardt put it. He said, when you see a stop sign in traffic, you never stop and think, now this is a piece of metal with red and white paint on it. You don't examine the ingredients of the metal or the paint. You simply read the message. Stop. And you ask the question, what is the message of this sign? So it is with signs in the Gospel of John. You ask, what is the message in this sign? The signs in John's Gospels have messages, and you focus on the message more than the sign itself. So, so we're going to have... Uh, in John, uh, in chapters 2 through 12, there are seven miracles or seven signs, as John calls them. And even the fact that there's exactly seven, Adam Hamilton and others point out, is probably intentional. Because in the ancient world, seven rep represented uh, completeness or perfection. So obviously, even that in and of itself shows us that these stories of these miracles need to be read more deeply. And so, of course, I had to go through, and after Hamilton mentions in his book that there are seven signs, but he doesn't tell what all of them are, I had to go through and <laughs> read and find them. So I'll share it with you. Uh, these are changing water into wine, curing the royal official's son, which Jesus does from a distance, curing a lame man uh, at Bethsaida, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing a man born blind, and that's in chapter 9 and is such an important story that John takes a whole chapter for it, and then finally raising Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. So when we read the Gospel of John, both these stories about the signs or anything else, we want to pay attention to the details. John puts details in there on purpose, and, and Adam Hamilton suggests that as you're reading John, Maybe you go back and read it a second time and kind of ask yourself, why is this detail in here? And then look at the, these stories and ask yourself about that story. What is this telling me about Jesus? Who is this man, Jesus? 
how does Jesus affect my life and what is required of me? Okay, so I said there's seven signs. Uh, in Adam Hamilton's book, he talks about two of them in his chapter. He, he gives you some depth into uh, the first of these signs, which is the changing of the water into wine. And then he also talks about the blind man. I'm only going to take one of those because it takes a while to really plummet the depths of, or do you plummet? Well, you plummet if you're going under. Maybe you, I meant to plumb the depths of this particular story. So first things first, let me grab this particular story and read it to you. And it comes out of the second chapter of the Gospel of John. So it's very early in the story. Jesus has begun to have some disciples coming about him. And so John tells us then uh, on the third, well, let me back up a little bit too and say that before we get to this chapter, Jesus, it, some people are coming to Jesus and becoming disciples. And the last one was Nathaniel. He was the one that was under the tree. And Philip says, uh, says something to him about him. And he, he says, I found a genuine Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Oh, I'm sorry. I read the wrong part there. <laughs> anyway, Philip tells Nathaniel, we found the Messiah, and he's from uh, Nazareth. And, and uh, Nathaniel says, oh, really, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, then he goes ahead to go see, and as he's walking up, Jesus says, here comes a genuine, uh, here comes a genuine Israelite. And then Nathaniel's like, well, how do you know me? Well, before Philip brought you to me, I saw you under the fig tree, Jesus says, which just astonishes him. Nathaniel said, Rabbi, you are God's son. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus answered, well, do you believe me because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you, you will see heaven open and God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth on the human one. So he's just got done telling him, you're going to see much more marvelous things than this. And then John says, on the third day, there was a wedding, a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They don't have any wine. Jesus replied, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. i got to stop before I go on, because that always sounds like Jesus is being sassy with his mother. But I have read more than one scholar that said the term that he uses here when he addresses his mother was not it's translated woman, but it was actually a term of endearment and, and is the very word that he uses when he addresses her from the cross. So he wasn't being sassy. His mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Well, nearby were six stone water jars used for the Jewish cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now, Draw some from them and take it to the head waiter, and so they did. And the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom, and he said, Well, everyone serves the good wine first. They bring out the second-rate wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You kept the good wine until now. And this was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glories, glory, and his disciples believed in him. So that's our first miracle or sign. You know, you can appreciate this story even on the most surface level. I mean, there's a big wedding going on. Uh, and of course, a wedding is a time of joy. And so it's nice to see that Jesus participates in this activity of joy. But And a wedding is something that's part of, well, normal life. I start to say everyday life. You don't have a wedding every day. But a year in and year out, there are weddings, and we all go to weddings, and here's a wedding in a little village, and Jesus is is there. Uh, he, he's participating in the type of things that we participate in in humans. He didn't set himself up there and say, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm not going to do those things. He's joining in joy with his neighbors and his friends. And, of course, in, in those days, the wedding was a huge deal. Now, it's a huge deal now. It's a big deal when you're having a wedding. And it is certainly a time of festivity. But it was really a time of festivity then. The, they'd have the wedding ceremony, and then they'd celebrate for the next seven days. The bride and groom staying in the area. 
and the bride and groom would be treated and actually called the king and the queen for that week. But they had lots of food and they drank wine, not just because wine was drunk instead of water, but it was a big deal. And it would have been a terrible embarrassment to run out of things for your guest. So Mary comes to Jesus and tells him that they're running out of water. And he, uh, he seems to think, no, you don't need to worry about that, Mom. But he goes ahead and takes care of it. So it seems like, well, that's a really nice story because it takes care of his mother. That's a really nice story because Jesus cared about this couple and he didn't want them to be embarrassed by the lack of wine. And he provided for them. So that's okay. We can read it like that, and it's a good story. But what else is here? Why this story about a wedding feast? This is going to be the first miracle that John tells us about. This is going to be the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, as John tells us. Well, you know, I'm looking right now, and I read this to you. I read it out of my Wesley Study Bible. And most good study Bibles will have a few little notes. Let me see if I can find this here. Here it is. The Wesley Study Bible says, In Jesus, God's future salvation and abundant life are present. That's not what I was going to read. Here, here we go. Jesus is the bringer of God's overflowing grace and end-time salvation, which the prophets depicted as a wedding feast and a time of abundant wine. I want you to hear that again. End-time salvation was depicted by the prophets as a, a feast, often a wedding feast, and a time with an abundance of food and wine. So we are meant to think about the fullness of time when God comes and restores God's people. When what we call now the second coming, what the Jewish people looked at as the day of the Lord, when it came, it's compared to a big wedding feast. And let me give you an, an example. This is from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of heavenly forces will prepare for all people a rich feast, a feast of choice wines, of select foods rich in flavor, uh, of choice wines well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the veil that is veiling all people the shroud enshrouding all nations, he will swallow up death forever. So in these beautiful words about life eternal, about God overcoming death and swallowing it up forever, you see how the writer is referring to a feast and to plenty of wine. So obviously, there's, this, is, this story in John is more about just a simple wedding feast where they almost ran out of wine. We are meant to think about the fullness of God's time. We are meant to think uh, about the, the last days. We are meant to think about what it means to be in the kingdom of God. So let's do a little more digging. You might recall that the writer said that there were six stone jars used for washing. Six stone jars used for ritual washing. Now the washing was a big deal to the Jewish people. there. If you look at the Old Testament, you're going to see some references to people being unclean and having to wash. And there's somewhere in there, there's a little reference to uh, the priest Aaron washing his hands. And from that, and pulling away from the scripture itself, or sort of enhancing it, the Jewish rabbis had begun to teach the importance of ritual hand washing. If you didn't wash your hands, they were not clean. And so the, the ritual... And the fact that you had to wash your hands kind of shows that people are made unclean, that they are made unpure, that we are unclean sinners. So all this washing needed to go on. And let me tell you just how much washing and how important it was. I'm going to let William Barclay describe to us the, the ceremony, the ritual hand washing that these people followed. Let me see if I can find it here. Here it is. He said, strict Jews wash the hands before a meal and between each course of the meal. First, the hand was held upright and water was poured over it in such a way that it ran all the way down to the wrist. Then that same hand was pointed down and the water was poured in such a way that it ran from the wrist to the fingertips. Then this was done in turn with each hand. So you're going to do one hand at a time in turn with each hand. 
and then each palm was cleansed by rubbing it with the fist of the other hand. The Jewish ceremonial law insisted that this should be done, not only at the beginning of a meal, but also in between courses. If it was not done, the hands were technically unclean. So Jesus has these guys, these servants, guys, take the water from these jars of water or to add to these jars of water that were there so that people could be ceremonial, ceremonially clean. Again, with that whole emphasis on how we are unclean. And uh, so they obviously represent uh, the need to become clean, but also the water becomes wine. And in a lot of the Hebrew scripture, wine was a metaphor for blessing and joy. So we've gone from the water. We don't need the water to purify ourselves anymore. Now we have wine. Again, blessing and joy, which makes us hearken back to the whole idea of the feast and being before God. And then he makes a point of telling us exactly how many jars. Now that might be so we know how much wine there is, but also six. Why six? Actually, the, the important number, or an important number, and I've already mentioned this, was seven which meant things that were complete and perfect. So maybe there's six jars because of them being the jars of the ceremonial washing. So they represent the imperfections of the law. The law was good as God had given it and it was beautiful. But Jesus came to fulfill the law and to move us along, you might say. Uh, here's what William Barclay says. Jesus came to do away with the imperfections of the law. Well, I'm say that again. Jesus came to do away with the imperfections of the law and to put in their place the new wine of the gospel of grace. Jesus turned the imperfections of the law into the perfection of grace. And I will say that's in the same way as the writer of Hebrews talks about how there had to be continual animal sacrifices for sin, but then we had Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. So it shows that fulfillment that's coming in Jesus. Something new is obviously here, and that's what is being signaled to the, to the reader and to the apostles. Uh, even the type of the jar that it's in matters, because John made a point of telling us they were stone jars. And as Adam Hamilton points out, <clears throat> most often you would be using a clay jar. So perhaps, he said, the stone will harken back to what Ezekiel says in the 32nd chapter, and again, looking forward to the fulfillment of time to God's people, uh, having that Messiah and building the relationship that Jesus allows us to build. Ezekiel says, uh, has God saying, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your stony heart from your body and replace it with a living one so that the stone jars remind us of our stone hearts. Jars of water become wine and something else. The, uh, John makes a point, too, that the jars are filled to the brim, so they're filled all the way up. So Hamilton says that that detail shows us that Jesus wants to fill us completely. We are meant to be overflowing as a cup runneth over. This detail, I think, ties into the purpose that John uh, asserts for his gospel. This is in the 20th chapter. He talks about how I could write about a whole many, many, many other things that Jesus did, but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. So we've already talked about, you know, how the thing is full to the brim. And let me just say, too, that these jars hold a lot. Uh, the writer says that it was the equivalent of 20 or 30 gallons. So if it was 30 gallons times six, that would be 180 gallons Try to get that image in your head. This is not a pretty image, but I thought, what do I know of that's 30 gallons? And then I said, well, a lot of garbage cans <clears throat> are 30 gallons. That's just to give you an idea of volume. Uh, obviously, if you had 180 gallons, that would be abundantly far more than you would need for any wedding feast. Because Jesus came to give us life and Jesus will say in the Gospel of John, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So life in Jesus is abundant. 
God's grace in Jesus never runs out. I was quoting something from the Lutheran pastor Edward Marquardt before. Listen to what he says about the 180 gallons. Jesus took 180 gallons of Jewish laws, the rituals of purification, and transformed them in to 180 gallons of grace. There's enough grace here for a whole city, enough grace for a whole state, enough grace for the whole wide world. From God's fullness of grace right up to the brim, we have all received grace upon grace. And finally, let me say that uh, in this, when, when John gets to the end of this, uh, this story, in verse 11, he says, <clears throat> this was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So we might read this and say, well, Jesus revealed his glory and that's what it's for. And I can tell you in my younger days, I thought that <clears throat> what that meant is that his glory was revealed to his disciples because they could see that Jesus was powerful. I mean, who do you know that can turn water into wine? But then if you begin to study the, the Gospel of John, you see that glory takes on a different meaning. Read through the Gospel of John, and Jesus will talk about coming into his glory. Jesus will talk about when he is going to be glorified. And if you read the whole thing in context, you begin to realize that Jesus, the glory in the Gospel of John, is the crucifixion. Glory in the Gospel of John is when Jesus pours out his entire self for you and for me. That self-giving love of Jesus. That's his glory. Jesus wasn't seeking earthly glory. We have a tendency sometimes when we hear the word glory to think of earthly glory. But Jesus was seeking the glory of obeying his Father. And Jesus was seeking the glory of pouring himself out, of emptying himself in love for us. Here's part of his prayer in John chapter 17, right before the crucifixion. He says, Father, the time has come. <clears throat> glorify your son so that the son can glorify you. You have given your son authority over everyone so that he could give eternal life to everyone you gave him. And this is eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I shared with you before the world was created. You hear Jesus? He says, I glorify you on earth by finishing the work you gave me. And the work that he gave him, the finishing, comes on the cross when Jesus perfects himself in love and he perfects us in love. You know, we, the church, often look for the wrong kind of glory. We care about what people think about us. We care about if we look like we have enough people in church. We, we think that the glory of God is going to be manifested in some kind of powerful work and everybody's going to sit up and pay attention instead of seeing it as something quiet, like the serving love that Jesus has here for this couple when he provides them with wine. We in the church need to lear learn that the glory of God is manifested in and through us when we live humbly and when we suffer patiently for the sake of Christ in the gospel. That's where the real glory comes from. So just this one sign, this one miracle, Jesus took ordinary water, the, the, the water, the jars of water that were used for the normal purification ritual, and he made them into something extraordinary, something abundant, something filled to the brim, something that is puts us in mind of joy and of life, like the abundant life that Jesus brings to us. Friends, Jesus transforms the ordinary in the same way. He transforms the ordinary and he can transform you and he can transform me in the same way that he transformed an ordinary fisherman into a great apostle. Jesus can transform you and me in the same way that he took that ordinary water and transformed it into something abundant and full. Jesus can make you and me and our church something that is able to do amazing and powerful works in his name. He came that we may have life 
and have it more abundantly. May you have a blessed week, my friends. Bye-bye.